that? Okay. I never know. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I am. Uh, it is nice to be back here in Texas. Amen. And uh, you know, I. How many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? And uh, you know, I got off the plane. Uh, in Texas, and it was 99 degrees, and, and I thought to myself, who looked into the ark in Texas? Because that's what, it was hot, you guys, down here. Uh, God bless your hearts for continuing to live here. Uh, the gospel needs to be in Texas as well. And uh, so I'll come visit you later on in the year. All right. Well, today, we're going to look at a message that I've actually titled the unseen war. And we know what the Apostle Paul talks about. He talks about warfare throughout his epistles, and, and he actually says, you know, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And when you think about that, I want you to understand what that means. He's, he's talking about in the unseen realm. And get this. He says, you wrestle. And that means that this war is up close and personal. And listen to me, this war is coming to you. You don't get to sit this one out. You don't get to say that, well, I don't want to fight. You know, I'm, I'm not interested. I don't want to pick this fight. Just leave me alone. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the principalities and powers are coming. And they're coming to destroy you. And so today, I want to show you what it looks like to wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against these demonic powers. And the best story, one of the best stories we have in Scripture is that of Job. And you really want to, some of the things that we talk about today, you want to let sink in. There is so much to glean from this story. It's not just about, hey, you know, I need to feel better about myself and my situation, so I'm going to go read Job. Uh, that's not what this is. It goes way beyond that. You're going to receive the weapons of your warfare, which are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Amen? Amen. And so with that said, let's break into this. And let me preface today, I, I, I can't cover this in a, in a scope that I would like to. I, we'd be here for a long time through the winter. That'd be <laughs> but we are going to cover enough today for you to go home, for you to be armed, for you to be equipped, for you to be challenged. And so with that said, let's open up Job uh, chapter 1, verse 1. This is what we read. There was a man in the land of Uz, or Uts in the Hebrew, whose name was Eov, Job. Now, this man, the land of Uz, is not Israel. Job lives outside of Israel. In fact, actually, when you read Scripture in the book of Lamentations, it talks about how the daughters of Adom, Edom, Edomites, descendants of Esau, dwell in Uz. See, Job is a Gentile. And, and that's very, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing to think about because actually what you discover uh, when you go to Talmudic writings and you look at the discussions of the rabbis, they, they talk about Job. There's this very lengthy discourse in the Talmud. And one of the things they say is that he is literally one of seven prophets given to the Gentiles. It's a fascinating thought. But what you're going to see today is it goes way beyond that. Job is a prophet to the church. He's a prophet to the believers in Messiah Yeshua, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now we go on and we read this. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, you will find this. This is what I call the structure of the faith. You will find this structure all throughout Scripture. It's unbelievable. Everywhere you go, you can look at Deuteronomy 5.29. The Lord cries out. His heart is pleading for his people. Oh, that these people had such a heart in them that they would fear me 
and always keep my commandments. They shun evil. That's the whole concept. And then you, you, you forge ahead in Ecclesiastes. Solomon ends the book by saying, what is the conclusion of the whole matter? What's the meaning of life? What is the call of duty? Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And then you jump into the New Testament, and interestingly enough, Peter is speaking to Gentiles. And as he's speaking to Gentiles, he's, he's blown away what God did to them. And he says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Powerful. I don't need to know anything else. I, I have right now everything I need to know about who this man Job is. This is a servant of the Most High God. This is a servant who the Lord has received. He's the real deal. And then we continue in verse 2 and we read, And he had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Very, very significant. We don't have time to plumb the depths of this, but the numbers are sacred. These are sacred numbers, biblically speaking. Seven needs no introduction from Genesis, literally from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. Seven is a sacred, holy, it's a number of perfection. It's a number of completeness. And so is three. Three needs no introduction. Everything's established on the testimony of two or three, right? I mean, even, even the Tanakh divided, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. It's divided into three. And the most notable thing is Yeshua rose the third day. And then you put these numbers together, and what do you get? Ten. Ten is the number of judgment, it is the number of eternity. That's huge. It's the number of eternity. It's the number of righteousness. So this is very significant. Now it goes on and it says this. It says, also his possessions were 7,000 sheep. Oh, 3,000 camels. Isn't that interesting? Again, this reiteration of 7 and 3 and together they're 10. Which it gets crazier, and then it goes on and says he has 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. So what they're saying here, what the writers, as he's introduced, and he says Job's wealth and his blessing, which Pastor Lex preached on, it was unparalleled. He is the greatest of the men of the East in wealth. Now, dropping down into verse 6, we read this. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, the Bene Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord. This is talking about the angels of God. And Satan also came among them. Now, you look at that and what you realize, what is Satan doing here? Well, the answer is, is he hasn't been cast out of heaven. Not yet. In fact, that wouldn't happen until the glory of Yeshua was revealed. It all centered around him. He gains our Father in heaven the victory. Amen? And so we have this situation. Moving to verse 7. And the Lord said to Hasatan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, oh, and from walking back and forth on it. What is Satan doing? Does he like long walks on the beach and beautiful sunsets? Is, is that why he's walking the earth? He's causing trouble. In fact, Peter says this. I love what Peter says. Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, oh, he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What is the devil doing? He has returned from hunting. He is a hunter, and he is hunting you. He's hunting the souls of humanity. He wants to destroy you. 
And I think about this because you read about in Genesis, right? This Nimrod character who is, he was the, the ancient form of the Antichrist. Nimrod gathered the entire world at the Tower of Babel to himself to become one people. And he was literally called Mighty Hunter. He's a mighty hunter before the Lord. Well, this is what Satan's doing. He's going forth to seduce, to allure, and to deceive. And ultimately, destroy. And we read in Psalm 10, this is an amazing statement. He lies in wait secretly. He's deceptive. He's seductive. As a lion in his den, he lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. This is what it's all about. This is who Satan is. And it's amazing to me because in Revelation 12, it actually sends out this cry, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. He knows he has a short time. The devil is not sleeping. He's not going to take a break. He's coming. The principalities and powers, the demonic hosts of wickedness are coming. And all you need to do is, man, look at what's happening right now in the world. And you know he is working overtime. Moving ahead into verse 8. Then Yahweh said to Hasatan, have you considered my servant Job? The Lord knows exactly what he was doing, that he went out to deceive, to seduce, to destroy. This is an amazing statement. The Lord turns the devil's attention. Well, have you considered my servant? He says, my servant. My servant Job. The Lord is picking a fight with the devil. And the, the most amazing thing about this is, why? He's proud of Job. See, the Lord loves to be loved. If, if you're a parent and you've ever had that moment that you just want to capture it and you're like, I don't want to leave this moment, it's amazing. When your children do something so beautiful, so selfless, so loving, that you see the Lord working through them, you as a parent, come on. You're like, I bottle this. I want this moment. It was so precious. And they make you so proud. You as a parent, you want to go out. You want to testify to the world. Look at mine. Look at my child. This is amazing to me. that the, This is the impact that the love of Job for his God made on God. That blows my mind. And it, I mean, it just moves me in a way that Man, I need to focus on loving him. Loving him. And what is said next is one of the most radical statements I've ever read by God himself. These, this is the Lord. You'll be hard-pressed to find any words more intense than what the Lord is going to say of this man, Job. Because as he continues, he says this, that there is none like him on the earth. Okay, so the introduction of Job is he's the greatest man of the East. But when the Lord comes to the table, he actually says he's the greatest man on the earth. There's none like him on the earth. Oh my goodness. What is it about Job that the Lord finds so great? Is it all the blessing of which God gave him? Not at all. Here it is, that he is a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. What is greatness in the eyes of our God? To the point that he says there's none like him on earth. The Lord doesn't mention one thing that he possesses in this life. The only thing he mentions is he loves me. That's the greatness. He fears me. He keeps my commandments now you got to understand that the book of job and again we're, we're not going to delve into the depths of this this book is highly prophetic of the end times in tribulation job is a picture of the church in the last days 
And I want to put this into a little prophetic context so that this can become tangible as we're looking at the life of Job. We read the following in Ezekiel 14, 13. Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I want to stop. When a land, when a country sins against him by persistent unfaithfulness, when that country starts legislating evil and you start making it a protective right to murder the unborn and you start to legislate gay homosexual marriage and call that as a protective right, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will, not I might, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread. I will send famine on it. And I cut off man and beast from it. The Lord will pour out his fury, his judgment. It's going to happen. And if you have any eyes to see right now, you already see the Lord's judgment coming. Okay, the Torah portion today is the blessings and the curses. I challenge you, go home and read all of the curses that the Lord brings upon people, upon his people, when they have sinned against him, one of those, interestingly enough, is the biggest issue of the day. Illegal immigration. You go and read the Torah, it says that when the Lord is judging those, he will bring in the aliens from afar, and he will raise them up higher and higher, and he'll bring you lower and lower. Judgment's already here. And people don't even realize it. But then we're going to get to the point of why I brought you here. Verse 14, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would only deliver themselves by their righteousness. Says, not Daniel, but the Lord God. Do we understand the bar? The bar is Noah Daniel, Noah was in a generation that faced what? The judgment of God. Eight people survived that flood. Entire world destroyed. You want to talk about the way is narrow? It's difficult? There are many called, but few chosen. And in Noah's day, it was hate. And in the days of Moses and the Exodus, it was two. Joshua and Caleb, out of over 600,000 men, two got in. Oh, my goodness. See, now this puts the life of Job, when I read this, into some serious perspective. This is what it takes. That's the bar. And that causes me to tremble before God because how many of you are going to stand right now and say, I'm at Noah's level? I'm at the prophet Daniel's level. I'm at Job's level. That's, there's a time coming where Yeshua is going to tell all oh, so many Christians and Messianics. Just like Lex quoted today, why do you call me Lord, Lord? You didn't do what I said. Many will say to me in that day, many. The bar is scary, let it sink in. Going back, there's none like him on the earth who fears God and shuns evil. Moving to verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Oh, you've made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. This is what the devil believes. I think about this. Satan is suggesting to the Lord, Oh, Job's love for you is artificial. It's an inch deep. Why don't you take what he has? All those blessings, all those worldly possessions that he has right now, and you will find out he hates you. What he loves is those things of the world. He loves the possessions. I mean, this you look at this, a war has broken out into heaven, right? 
And craziest part, guess who's not involved in this little conversation? Job. This is the unseen war. He doesn't know anything that's going on. He doesn't know that the Lord has picked a fight with the devil. And this devil is challenging, in return, the Lord. Verse 12, this is how the Lord responds. And the Lord said to Hasatan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Satan gets the green light from the Lord. All power, all authority is now his. The only thing off limits is his own personhood. That's it. The next thing you read, interestingly enough, is Satan goes forth and what? He unleashes hell on Job. So the servants of Job are tending to the oxen and to the donkey. And he has many servants, we're not told the number, but he has many servants looking over them. And you know he's the wealthiest man of the East. All of a sudden the Sabians come in and they raid Job's property. They steal the oxen, they steal the donkeys, and they kill every servant but one. And then that servant that Satan left alive, he only did so so that he could bring this horrible news to Job. And as this servant is telling Job all of this, another servant literally comes in at that time and says, Fire fell from heaven and has destroyed all your servants and all the sheep. I alone am left. And now you think about that, and, and again, we don't get to plumb the depths today. But this second servant to come says he called fire, fire came down from heaven. What do you read in Revelation? It's exactly what the beast does. The second beast in Revelation calls fire down from heaven. Oh, and by the way, it's in the context of disciple. Unbelievable. While that servant is talking, a third servant comes in. And he says, the Chaldeans have raided us. They've raided the camels. All the servants, they've, they've killed them all, except me. And they stole the camels. What does Yeshua say in John chapter 10? He says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. And these first three servants, Job is feeling it. But again, he has no clue what is going on. But the last servant that is going to come in, well, it's going to make all... I mean, Job is penniless. He was a multi, multi-millionaire one second before these servants come to him, and now he's in total poverty, owns nothing. And then the last and final servant comes in and says, Your children... Your seven sons, your three daughters, they were all in the house of their oldest brother. And a strong wind comes in, took out the four corners. They're dead. I can't process that. There's no way I can process that pain. I can't do it. I've seen people go through it. And I can tell you right now, I don't ever want to see it again. It had that big of an impact on my life. All I can do is sympathize. I cannot empathize. That is a pain that I can't imagine. And people that have experienced that kind of loss will absolutely tell you, I didn't know I could hurt that much. It's beyond description. I can't describe it. Unfortunately, it's just for those who have experienced it's, it's the emotion that's so deep into your heart, you realize we're never meant to know this. All his children gone. This is tribulation. This is unbelievable. Verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And then it goes on and says this. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. It's amazing because that's what you read in the Torah. 
in Deuteronomy 32. The Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. The Lord wounds and he heals. Job has this knowledge that the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but what he says next, it's the famed statement, blessed be the name of the Lord. Satan was waiting in the wings. At that moment, he was betting against Job. He believed with his whole heart he is going to curse God right now. After hearing the death of his children, surely he's going to crack, he's going to break and blame God and be angry at God. How dare you take my children from me? And instead of doing that, he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, it's interesting. This is just a coincidence. But this statement is seven words in the English and three in the Hebrew. Absolutely fascinating. I want to ask you a question. What does it mean, blessed be the name of the Lord? Now, this is something, this is a story that has hit me so hard and gripped me. What does that really mean? Well, in Exodus 34, it says, Yahweh, Yahweh, El Rechum, Vechanun, Erechapain, Verav Chesed, Veyamet. In the English, it says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. This is what the Lord proclaimed. He said, I'm going to proclaim my name in front of Moshe. What does his name mean? What does it mean to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord? Job went to the mat on his knees and said, my God is merciful. He is patient. He's kind. He's gracious. He's chesed. As you look at that term goodness, in the Hebrew, it's chesed. He is filled with loving kindness. And Job says this after he lost everything. Do you have this kind of dedication? Do you have this kind of faith where you can worship the Lord with a pure heart in a moment that I can't even put into words? In this kind of grieving. You want to talk about, you know, when we go to the Bible, God help us. Because you will be challenged more than you could ever have conceived. And then you read in verse 22. And all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with the wrong. In all of it. The expectation, Satan was there. He was positive. He's going to turn from the Lord. He's going to curse him. He's going to hate God after what I did. And did it, did it look like the enemy showed mercy to Job? You want to see how vile and wicked this darkness is? There isn't a line where Satan says, oh, that's too far. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. You know what I'll do? I'll, I'll, I'll keep one of his sons, one of his daughters. I'll, I'll let them go because this is crazy. There is no light in your adversary. There's no light. There's no mercy. And that's why, don't you dare get tangled up in the darkness. You will rue the day. You don't want to dance with the devil. Trust me. You do not want to do that. Moving to chapter 2, verse 1, here we go. Again, there was a day when the Bnei Halohim came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord, verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Again, what is the devil doing? He's hunting. He's never satisfied. With know how many people he takes out, with, with how many people he gets to bend the knee to him and worship him and serve him, it's not enough. He's a hunter. Then the Lord said to Satan, Oh no, here we go again. Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? Now, could you imagine if Job was present for this conversation? He'd be like, Lord, what are you doing to me? What is the, because you know this isn't, in the flesh, this isn't going to go well. The Lord challenges, the Lord is so proud of his servant for loving him so faithfully. 
The Lord brings him back to the table. Have you considered my servant Job? None like him on the earth. Twice the Lord says this crazy radical statement. A blameless man, an upright man. One who fears God and shuns evil and still... He holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. You know, the Lord is not impressed when we bless him on the high hills of blessing. When everything is going well for you, that's not impressive. It's impressive when you do it where Job is. When you're in the valley of shadow of death, that's impressive. That's when the Lord takes note. And he loves to be loved like that. Where he realizes your love is not for the things of the world, but it's for him. It's for him. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. Take this in, because this is what the enemy believes in regard to you. He believes if your life is going to be called into account, you're going to fold. You're going to compromise. And if you've ever read the Bible, this is what we see. What do we read in Revelation? Let's look at it. We read this. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. See, here's the deal. When deception doesn't work, when seduction isn't working, when he can't allure you with the things of the world, he literally goes for the jugular. It becomes a do or die. You will worship me or I will take you out. And the expectation is you're going to fold. You're going to declare God's... You're going to declare Jesus just isn't worth it. He's not worth you dying. Yet Satan wants that moment. And in the end times, this is what he does. And unfortunately, we already know many, many are going to bend the knee to the devil to save their own skin. That's what's going to happen. In fact, when you read early church history, this is what happened. You know, I want to take you, I want to show you just two good examples. Both in the second century. The first one is the martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp being a disciple of John. And Polycarp was a, was a righteous man of God. But, you know, that era, Rome really got to the point where they got intolerant of Christianity. They got intolerant. They had had enough. They didn't want any of it. So a great persecution arises. Well, I want to read these words. Check this out. And when Polycarp came near, the proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On his confession that he was, oh, the proconsul sought to per, per, uh, persuade him to deny Christ. That's the deal. Deny him. Swear by the fortune of Caesar, meaning the blessing and power and authority. You're not to swear by the Lord God, even though we could get into Yeshua says, neither swear by heaven and earth, it's not yours. But swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say, away with the atheist. Now don't let that fool you, because in, in the first and second, in the early church, first, second century, Romans called Christians atheists. We were the atheists. It's interesting. Right? Because we didn't believe in the Roman gods. Away with the Aesop. So he was wanting to tell him, away with Christians. Swear the oath, and I will set thee at liberty. Curse Christ. What is devil, what does the devil want Job to do? What is he betting on? He'll curse God to his face. Curse him to his face. This is literally what is happening in Christianity. The devil's going out. He's betting this is going to happen. Now, with Polycarp, it doesn't happen. Polycarp's burned at the stake and stabbed to death. Horrible, gruesome murder. But other people 
in his generation did. In fact, even in the writing of the martyrdom of Polycarp, there's a man by the name of Quintus who they called Quintus the apostate because Quintus saw what was happening to his brothers and sisters in the church and he stepped back and what did he do? Cursed him. The devil's expectation was just that. Same expectation he had with Job. As you look at the history of Pliny, known as Pliny the Younger, this was the governor of Bithynia and Pontus, which it's my understanding that Pastor Mike is taking you through 1 Peter right now. Well, go back to the introduction. Peter wrote to Bithynia and Pontus. There was an awesome move of the Holy Spirit, believers coming into the faith. He wrote to them. We know there's a Christian presence, but now you got Pliny the governor working on behalf of Emperor Trajan, early 2nd century. And he's intolerant to Christianity. He's unleashed hell on them, forcing them, you, you, you denounce Christ or die. And so Pliny writes to Trajan to tell Trajan, this is how I'm dealing with these Christians. I interrogated them whether they were Christians. If they confessed it, I repeated the question twice again, adding the threat of capital punishment. If they still persevered, I ordered them to be executed. Those who deny they were or had ever been Christians or who repeated after me an invocation to the gods and offered adoration with wine and frankincense to your image, image of the beast, this is the image of the emperors, they deified them, which I ordered to be brought for that purpose together with those of the gods and who finally cursed Christ. Because the devil was betting against him. He knew that when it comes to their life, their own life, and that's put on the line, they're going to compromise. They're going to step back. Well, that's exactly what's going on in our story. Devil says skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. And Satan means even his love for God, even his love for Yeshua. Verse 5 but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to his face. Again, the expectation. This is what's going to happen. And so the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. This is what we read in Revelation 13. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given him out of every tribe, tongue, and nation. The parallels are uncanny because the goal hasn't changed. The goal is to get you to blame God, to be angry with God, to curse him, to compromise. That's the goal. Verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now, to further put this into perspective, I want to take you to the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is this beautiful Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that predates Yeshua. We're talking 3rd century B.C. And so there are many things that are preserved here that are invaluable. One such thing is, is that it puts this situation into better context so you can appreciate what we're reading here. But when you go to the Septuagint, this verse reads this way. And he took a potsherd in order to scrape the pus and sat on the dunghill outside the city. That is disgusting. He has these horrendous boils all over his body that are oozing this pus and he's taking broken pieces of pottery and scraping himself. I mean, this is, this is horrific. You think, you think the devil's like, you know what, I'm not going to bring a plague on him. That's, that's really not that bad. He released a cocktail like the world has never seen on Job. And we go, to put this into further perspective, we jump ahead and he, he goes on and says, my bones 
are pierced in the at the night in me at night, and my nine pains take no rest. Now that's pretty horrifying. Where there is no rest, it's constant. It's this chronic pain. It's this chronic agony. And then to further this, then we read this. My skin grows black and falls from me. My bones burn with fever. If you take everything that Job is being described about Job, every single one of these is amazingly found in what is known the bubonic plague or the black death. The boils, the pus coming out of them, skin turning black, the pain and agony to the bone. Half of Europe is said to have perished by the Black Death. And is said, man, I mean, when you were to get this, it was, it was such a gruesome sight. It scarred people who saw it. Just to see somebody suffering this way, it scarred them. And so you, you look at this. This is a good template. Now, it, I mean, you, every single descriptor points to the Black Death, but it doesn't go through and tell us, yeah, this, this is absolutely the bubonic plague. But it gives you a really good perspective of what Job's going through. Now, continuing, in Job 7.13, When I say, my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, because Job is looking for just a fragment, a moment of rest, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. The one hope of just a little bit of relief that he goes to turns into a living hell. Night tears. You know, I've had people, you know, getting into spiritual warfare. I've talked about, taught on spiritual warfare several times. And one of the things that I have seen over the years, and people have come up and asked me, is Daniel, is it possible for the devil to haunt us in our dreams, to get to us, to sow fear, intimidation? And the answer is biblically, yes. That is very, very possible. There are, men have shared dreams with me that I, are absolutely demonic. These are demonic attacks. Job is experiencing a demonic attack in his dreams. This stuff is real. And then we read this, verse 15. So that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body, I loathe my life. Job actually curses the day of his birth. He is praying for death. He doesn't want to live. And here's, you know, it's interesting talking about with people about tribulation, right? And, and, you know, I got people coming up to me as, you know, trying to strategize the tribulation. And the strategy is, how do we get through this? How do we preserve our life through this? How do we make sure we have enough? Here's the deal. This is what I know. When it comes to tribulation, you won't be strategizing how to survive. You'll be praying for death. Job is experiencing real tribulation. He's praying for death. And it's interesting the fact that he says, I loathe my life, because Yeshua says these words. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Those words that Job has spoken are pivotal. He hates his life. And I'm going to tell you, if you when you go through tribulation in this life, there are some that I've met that actually understand that. They hate their life. In this age. Verse 9. Then his wife. We're coming to the crescendo of the story here. Then his wife said to him. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. This is absolutely demonic. The one closest to Job. The only survivor. Of his immediate family. The one who has access. To his heart. Satan moves through. He's been waiting for the opportune moment to do this, to come to the person closest to him and to whisper in his ear, this is the time. Why do you hold fast your idea? Curse God and die. I've seen this before. Where did I see this? Oh, yeah, in the garden. 
How did Satan get to Adam? Through Eve. Eve. And it's even, it's, it's amazing, right? When Yeshua shares with his own, his number one apostle, Peter, he's in the innermost sanctum of, of the discipleship. When he shares with them what has to happen, that he has to go up and die, that he's going to be crucified, Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. And Yeshua turns to his disciple, you Peter, get behind me, Satan. That is scary deception. That's how vile your enemy is. Just when you think you've put up a, a safeguard in the front, you've got it over here. I've got my underneath. He comes to your blind spot to come and take you out. Now, to further help you appreciate this moment, in the Masoretic text, what we discover is this. The Masoretic text doesn't record anything but this verse. But when you go to the Septuagint, we get a much clearer understanding of actually the discussion that took place. And I want to I want to do this. I want to take you through this. And we're almost through the message. But in the Septuagint, the first thing we read in verse 9 is, after much time had passed. I want you to take that in because we're not told exactly how long Job suffered, but the Septuagint records much time. This wasn't two days of Job going through this. Much time. Satan was moving to wear him out. His wife said to him, how long will you wait? Saying, behold, I wait for just a little time to receive the hope of my deliverance. His wife just recorded what Job has said. And she has heard him say it. Job is clinging to his hope. He's not letting go of the Lord specifically and no. There's still hope for deliverance. He is plagued with the plague. And if it is the bubonic plague, if it's the black death, seven to ten days and you're gone. That's like a 60 to 90 percent kill ratio. I mean, when you looked at Job and people perceived you're a goner. Everything that in your flesh is telling you you're a dead man. There's no hope. Your life is without hope. And yet Job responds, he knows there's still hope. He still believes. He's not letting go of his faith. And his faith in the character of God, that he is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. I think of what Job says, and it's echoed by Jeremiah the prophet. Similar. You're going to see how similar this is. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity, and I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. It got so bad in Jeremiah's day that this is what he thought. But listen, he's not done. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. What does he recall to his mind? Because this is the payday right here. This is what you need to allow to sink in. This is how the Lord trains your hands for war, your fingers for battle. When you're in the midst of tribulation, this is the response. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The only thing that the prophet valued was the Lord himself, not even his own body. This is Job. This is the prophets. This is Jeremiah. This is what I call powerful. And so going back to verse 9, after much time had passed, behold, I wait for just a little time to receive the hope of my deliverance. For behold, your memory has been removed. Again, this is Job's wife. Your memory, Job, has been removed from the earth. Sons and daughters of my womb, pains and labors, that for no purpose I labored with hardship. His wife is looking, I labored in vain. 
For all these children, they're gone. They've been taken from me. And you, you sit in the refuse of worms and you spend the night in the open air. As for me, I am one that wanders about and a hired servant from place to place in house to house waiting for when the sun will set so I can rest from the distresses and griefs that now beset me. Do you know what Job, happened to Job's wife? Job is incapacitated. He can't even stand. So his wife, who's lost all her children, has to go out and earn a living just to feed her and Job. This is what she's doing. And then she's bearing this grief, and she's just waiting for the sun to set so she can stop laboring. I mean, you want to talk about hell for Job? It's also hell for his wife and what she is going through. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. She's broken. She's hurt. She's overcome by what has happened, by the, by, by the hopelessness that she sees in this situation. She doesn't, she's looking at her husband. There's no hope for him to recover. And so how does Job respond? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. This is where we are called to be. In a place where we're in the valley of the shadow of death, we've come off of the high hills of blessing, and all hell has broken loose in your home and in your life. It's in that moment that you want to do the most powerful thing that you can do. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You praise the Lord in the storm. Do you know how powerful that is? Satan is humiliated because he's waiting to show God how much you do not love him. He's waiting for that moment. He wants you to fall so he gets glory and he can prove God wrong and say, see, this person doesn't love you at all. But when you put the power of praise in your mouth in tribulation, that's a power like no other. That's a power like no other. Amen? All right. I'm going to close in prayer. Abba Father, we just give you praise and glory for this awesome Shabbat, for this time to come to Texas, to be with our family. Lord, and all the visitors and that you've brought into this place at this time, Lord, I know it's for a purpose, and I know your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts than ours. There's so much of what you're doing right now that we have to consider the Abrahamic faith where Abraham went out not knowing where he's going. But what Abraham did do is he believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed in the promise, your promise, Father, that you made to him and he never let it go. Even when you called his only son to death, by his own hand, he believed. That's the kind of faith we need. We need the perseverance of your servant, Job, to be able to bless your faithful name. Your name is faithful. When everything else in the world is telling us to curse you. Lord, give us that endurance, that perseverance, that strength, that power, because that's real power. To display the faithfulness of the prophets. Yeshua, you are worthy of all honor and praise. You are the only one worthy to unlock the scroll. You are the only one worthy to hang on the cross for the sins of humanity. No one else was found worthy. You alone. And we boast in your righteousness. We boast in your purity. We boast in your wisdom. And Lord, as Job boasted, we boast in your mercy and grace. 
And we just thank you for this Shabbat, Lord. And Lord, I pray you do a new thing in these last days with your servants, that you pour out your spirit on all flesh, and that the sons and daughters begin to prophesy, that the power of the Holy Spirit begins to move in a way that we've only read about. Lord, we don't want to read your book anymore as a story in history. We want to live it. We want to live it. And so we just give you all the praise. We thank you, Lord. And we pray this in the holy and mighty name of Yeshua. Amen.